Welcome to Murder Mile. Today, I'm standing on Chesapeake Avenue, W1. One street north of the killing of Soho Kingpin and Red Max Cassell. One street south of the brutal slaying of Dutch Leia. A few doors east of the fatal seizure of James MacDonald. And three streets south of the striptease of death. Coming soon to Murder Mile. Today, Shaftesbury Avenue is a supposed home of the West End show. But with very few new plays to warrant its nickname, Theatreland is little more than a slew of pointless pap. Where faded pop stars crow in six hits into two hours of tenuously linked drivel. Tired 1960s farces called Ooh Er Misses feature two repugnant horn dogs opening and closing doors until its hinges and their knickers fall off. And for the truly vapid, movies remade for the stage. So expect to see a rom-com of Schindler's List, Top Gun the Drag Act, a Busby Berkeley version of Amistad, and as the final nail in the coffin, as Disney has truly suckled this withered teak dry. A kitchen sink drama about the Marvel multiverse. And yet, had anyone opened their eyes, they would have seen that the real drama was on their doorstep. Demolished to make way for Shaftesbury Avenue. Back in the 1850s, King Street consisted of two lines of three-storey terraces, crammed full of semi-skilled working-class labourers, whether tailors, painters or tin-pot makers. On the top floor of 15 King Street, once lived Bertold Heiss, his wife Hannah, her toddler daughter, and soon a new baby. It should have been the happiest of times for this little family. But unlike a funny farce about infidelity, a lack of trust would lead to tragedy. My name is Michael, I am your tour guide, and this is Murder Mile. Episode 207, A Jealous Streak. Triggers. We all have our triggers. Those little ignitions of our dormant thoughts and our uncontrolled emotions. Which can make us smile, can make us cry. And if pressed too far, can make us snap. His full name was Berthold Theodore Heiss. A 34-year-old native of an unspecified town in Germany. What's most vexing about Berthold was that he wasn't a bad man. He worked hard, he didn't break the law, and he wasn't a layabout, a loafer, or a lout. He was just an ordinary man who refused to see his own faults. Described as professional but sober. Since his arrival, Berthold had been employed as a master tin plate worker at Messrs. Fairwig and Bullock on 16 Rupert Street, just off King Street. Being a semi skilled man in an in demand profession, he would fashion sheets of tin into all manner of household essentials using shears, hammers, and solder. According to Walter Bullock, the co-owner, Berthold was well-liked and well-regarded. Being a reliable man who was never late, never unruly, 
and prided himself on the quality of his work. Always a neat man, he liked his life to be as orderly as his appearance. He was sober in character and drink as he rarely drank. Sadly, we know very little about his love life. Whether he was ever engaged, previously wed, a gay bachelor, a grieving widower, or was simply a singleton who was in and out of love, like an eternally jilted Romeo. Described as tall, dark and handsome, Berthold had no problem attracting the ladies. But that was one of his faults. It wasn't the single women who wooed him who he wanted, but the married ones. As a lover of other men's wives, he openly flirted with any filly who took his fancy. It is said he engaged in tawdry affairs with any woman who caught his glance for even a second. And even when shopping for basics like bread, he couldn't help but slather a sexy stranger with his smoothest words. Obviously, as a Lothario who preyed on those in a loveless marriage, there are no records of his illicit affairs or who with. But as much as he only thought of himself and his carnal lusts, he would never set aside a single iota about the fallout of his dirty little dalliances with an already wed woman who he had wooed into bed. Not her husband, her children, her life, or the aftermath. It's unsurprising that Hannah, his future wife, was described as an attractive lady. A real head-turner, who made men draw sharp breaths, with gaping mouths, a widening of eyes, and causing a slight shift in how they sat, often crossing their legs for fear that their lower half may muster a moral outrage. Twenty-seven-year-old Hannah Hodgkin was from Spalding in Lincolnshire, as one of several daughters to a family of farmers, she had come to London, possibly to start a new life where her past would never be known. Being an unmarried mother to two toddlers, one of whom who had recently died. Travelling 140 miles south from the remote wilds to the bustling throng of the big city must have come as a shock for Hannah. But gripped with grief and feeling her pain, she arrived with nothing but a bag of essentials and her toddler daughter, in search of paid work, a nice home, and hopefully a husband. Bertold was an obvious choice for Hannah, a tall, handsome man who was neat both in life and in style, a sober professional who as a steady worker could provide her with everything she could ever want. And as a lover, he would give her whatever she desired and take on the child of a man he had never met. In January 1853, at a nearby church, believed to be St Anne's in Soho, Hannah Hodgkin married Bertold Heiss in a small service attended by her family but not his. For Hannah, this was the start of a new year and a new life with a new husband. Shortly after their marriage, Mr. and Mrs. Heiss moved into the front attic rooms in a three-story terrace at 15 King Street. It was a decent lodging house owned by Mr. Powell, the local baker, and occupied by several tradespeople and their families. Entered via communal street door, at the top of the wooden stairs, 
the Heist family lived in two rooms. A kitchen sitting room and a small, tidy bedroom. For Hannah, it must have seemed like a dream come true. A happy marriage to a man she loved. A little toddler who was healthy and happy. And enough money to be comfortable. At that point, her life was perfect. Until something changed everything. Berthold loved the ladies. That little fact about his wandering eyes, his creeping hands, and his ardent loins, which longed to stand proud before a bud naked beauty who was already betrothed to another bloke, was well known. Whether whilst married to Hannah, he ever dipped his wick in another man's inkpot is unknown. But his thoughts were never far away from his beautiful new wife and her fidelity. He never saw the irony of his actions as when he flirted with women, it was just a bit of harmless fun. But when she dared to look at other men, or if they dared to ogle his lovely wife, Berthold would fume. Jealousy pervaded his every waking day and haunted his dreams, as he lay beside the woman he loved. As she slept soundly, he wondered which man she was dreaming of, never once thinking it could be him. As she dressed for the day, he questioned why she looked so pretty, why her perfume was so pungent, and he always checked to see if the ring was still on her finger, having had it placed there himself by God. In his mind, adultery was the ultimate sin, but only if the sin was committed by her and not him. Even the most ordinary of days could elicit his irritable temper. As simply walking along Berwick Street Market, shopping for the basics, his ire would rise as his eyes maybe saw what he believed. Was her licking her lips too often? her hands fondling fruit too suggestively, and a predatory wife-snatcher prowling these civilized streets, looking to pounce on his stunning young bride, and thus ruining a perfectly good marriage, owing to a Lothario's carnal lusts. At home, he would watch her, by keeping one eye open for any sign that she was having an affair. Whether a new dress, a racier shade of lippy, a crinkled bedsheet, or an extra cup in the washing-up bowl. But at work, it was worse as played by a possessive streak of jealousy. All he could think about was her. A small change became obvious to Walter Bullock, his boss at Messrs. Farwig and Bullock. As sometimes, Berthold's punctuality and professionalism had begun to slip. As instead of worrying about the solder on his tinware, he was focused on who his wife was shagging. There was no proof that Hannah was ever unfaithful. But once that seed had been planted, it could do nothing but grow. The summer of 1853 should have been a truly happy time for this little family. The weather was good, 
the home was fully furnished, and a swelling in her womb told Hannah that she was pregnant. Like a special little gift for both parents, the baby was to be born on or near to Christmas Day. By all accounts, Hannah was ecstatic with joy, but Bertolt was not. As a jealous man who trusted her as much as any man could trust him with their wife, although he had no evidence of an affair, a boyfriend, or any sex out of wedlock, he couldn't be certain if the child was his. When told of her happy news, his face was blank and his mouth grimaced. Her belly wasn't a countdown to family contentment, but a ticking time bomb to the moment of truth, as it would only be when he held that baby in his hands the Bertold would know if the child was his. Until then, he felt nothing for her or even for it. Every time she twinged, he felt no pains of sympathy. Every time she was sick, all he felt was utter revulsion at the thought of this thing, which was most likely conceived by another man's seed spat out in an immoral act of filth between her and him. At some point, they stopped sleeping together as Hannah and her infant daughter took the bed and an almost silent and motionless Bertolt made a bed in the sitting room. Feeling unwelcome in her own home, until the birth would prove her right. She couldn't move out as the money was his, as was the home. The bigger her belly got, the nearer the day of reckoning would come, the more unkind he became. Described by his neighbours as a man with a short fuse and a violent temper, those who heard them quarrel say it never lasted long, and it was rarely physical. And although he never hit her, he had once shaken this pregnant woman hard. By November, with Hannah's bulging bump, a perpetual reminder of what happiness or horror was to come, Bertold's work at the Tim Play factory was becoming inconsistent and sloppy. As his mind wandered, his hands trembled, and even amongst his colleagues, he became ratty and ill-tempered. He couldn't eat, he couldn't sleep, and he couldn't think about anything except who the father was. At work, of the many once trusted... He thought, is it him? Of any stranger in the street, he posited, perhaps it's him. In his tired and fevered brain, he interrogated himself. Is it a friend? Was it an ex-lover? Could it be a tenant or someone I don't know? Or maybe it was the man who looked at her all of those months ago on Berwick Street. As now, every smile was deeply suspicious. It was the not knowing which was driving Berthold crazy. The only way to know was for the baby to be born. Until then, he would have to wait and wait and wait. On Wednesday the 21st of December, in the attic room of 15 King Street, a baby was born.
ghostly pale and drenched in sweat. Hannah had done something miraculous in an era where one in 150 women died in childbirth. Sat slumped in a mattress bathed in blood. Her labor was so prolonged, she had barely enough strength to cuddle this bundle of joy, but just enough energy to smile. As this pink podgy mass of flesh gurgled at his adoring mum, The second miracle she had performed was that Hannah had done this all alone. As having sent her mother, Mrs. Hodgkin, a letter and some money to travel, she had arrived too late to aid her, and Bertolt was at work. At his usual hour, with no sprint in his step having been told of the birth, Bertolt arrived at home. In his hands, he didn't carry some flowers or a toy, and his face was far from the epitome of joy. Up the stairs, he lolloped like a condemned man climbing the scaffold to his own death. Setting foot inside his room, he saw his wife on his bed, holding her baby. She smiled, hoping her joy would be infectious. Only his face was as cold and hard as marble. The moment of truth had finally dawned. As with scrutinizing eyes, pressed into a harsh squint, Bertold gazed upon the little sprog before him, examining its eyes, its hair, its teeth, and its hands. We have no record of what the baby looked like, but Hannah's mother would state. He shook his head and simply said, Enough. Enough. Although what he meant by that will never be known. Moments later, he covered his shivering wife in warm bedclothes and whispered into her ear something unheard. The day was Saturday the 24th of December, 1853, Christmas Eve. Across King Street, a mattress of icy snow carpeted the cobblestone streets, and the grey sky was blanketed in a thick sooty haze of burning tinder, as the soothing smell of roasted chestnuts stayed in the air. It wasn't Christmas as we would know it today, but across the land, they celebrated the birth of a little boy. Still weak, after her Herculean ordeal, Hannah mostly slept clutching her baby, as her mother, and even Bertolt, who had taken the day off work, busied the house and ready the food while she rested. Mrs. Hodgkin would state of her son-in-law, he seemed, he seemed very kind, kind, which surprised her, given how Hannah had described him in her letters. And yet, Berthold showed no anger towards his wife or the child. At 7pm, as Berthold felt the need to purchase some necessities for the child, he escorted Mrs. Hodgkin not to the less salubrious Berwick Street Market in Soho, but over to Grafton Street in Mayfair. A much longer walk, but well worth it, being a well-to-do area where society elite 
would shop and eat. Having trudged for 20 minutes through the snow, although a little pooped, Bertolt decided to treat Mrs. Hodgkinson to tea and buns in a tea shop just off the Burlington Arcade. Warming their toes by the fire, as a merry band of minstrels played a festive tune. And just like the logs in the hearth, she had begun to warm to him. Berthold seemed like the perfect son-in-law as he popped off to get Hannah something special, stating, I'll only be but a minute. But as he left the one woman who could have saved her, Mrs. Hodgkin's words would haunt her for the rest of her life, replying, Mind you do, or I shall never find my way back. But then again, that was the point. At roughly 8.57 p.m., Berthold arrived on King Street. Not ambling in a slouch saunter as he had when he heard the baby was born, but his feet fixed with a determined sprint as he bolted upstairs to his room where his wife lay on his bed with her bastard baby who was born to another man's seed. Bursting open the wooden door to this front attic room, upon seeing his supposedly cheating wife, it didn't concern him that her toddler was playing at her side that Hannah was still bruised, swollen and bleeding from the strain of childbirth, or that this one-day-old baby was quietly suckling at her breast. All he saw was rage, as he started stabbing her with fevered hatred, using his eight-inch knife. As any mother would, with her instincts to protect, the left-hand side of her body took every piercing stab and slash as this weakened woman shielded her baby in her bleeding arms. Knowing, though, that she was no match for his blade, she screamed, Murder! as this limp lady stumbled from the room. With her terrified toddler clutching at mummy's leg, Hannah staggered onto the landing, her once white nightdress now sopping wet with thick red rivers from her neck to her legs. Seen by candlelight and said to be a shocking sight, Mr. Lloyd, a quick-witted neighbour, carried her profusely bleeding to the safety of his ground floor room, where on a sofa her strength would fail her. With the door locked, she was safe, and so was her toddler. But in her haste, her newborn baby had slipped from her grip. All the way down King Street, his panicked words were heard screaming, Fetch a doctor! Call the police! And with PC James Venner patrolling nearby Nassau Street, help was there within a minute. But by then, it was too late. Aided by PC Venner, Dr. Robert Martin of Frith Street entered the silent attic with trepidation. Inside, it was still. On the bedside table, the eight-inch blade still dripped as thick red globs oozed freely. 
said by the doctor, to be a frightful scene. The floorboards pulled with a never-ending sea of blood. And with the sheets soaked thick, steam rose as the hot blood mixed with the cold winter air blowing in. From the gaping wound in his neck, gurgling was heard. As across the bed, Berthold lay. With his own blade, he had slit his own throat from ear to ear. Described by a shocked doctor, all the blood vessels were cut. Every nerve was severed, and slitting across the larynx, both cartoid arteries and jugular veins were ripped. As having thrown himself in pained agony back onto the bed, having sliced right down to the bone, it was only the cervical vertebrae which had prevented his head from falling off. It didn't take a medical man to confirm the Berthold Heiss was dead. And yet, this room still had one more terrifying sight. At first, neither man had seen it, until it blinked. As among the sodden sheets, it was only when its blood-soaked lids opened wide and the whites of its eyes were seen that the baby was found. Silent, shocked, but with not a scratch on its little body. Along with her toddler and her baby, Hannah was taken to the Cleveland Street workhouse, where she was attended to by the surgeon, suffering several stab wounds to her face, arm, shoulder and chest. Three days later, an inquest was held in the vestry room at St Anne's Church in Soho, where it is said that the happy couple had married just a few months before. With Berthold's wounds self-inflicted, and his wife's wounds a deliberate act of attempted murder, as Hannah still clung to life. After much deliberation, the jury returned a verdict that he had destroyed himself while in a state of temporary insanity. For several days, Hannah was attended to by doctors who described her as being in a low and weak state. And although by New Year's Eve, her mother had said that she was progressing well. A few days into the new year, Hannah Heiss, a recently widowed mother of two, had succumbed to her injuries. With her body too weak, having only just given birth, although those stab wounds weren't too deep for such a young and healthy woman, her blood loss was too great and her strength was too little. There is no record of what happened to the toddler and the baby. Had her family adopted them, they may have stood a chance or by it scarred for life. But left to the workhouse, their fate would be sealed. Berthold Heiss lived his life loving other men's wives. He had no qualms about the families he ruined or the conflict he had created, just as long as he could fulfill his own carnal needs. But when the tables were turned and his own paranoia took hold, lives would be lost owing to his little jealous streak. That 
is that? Oh, cool, lummy. I'm going to put my little, uh, put my little uh, face mask of Alfred Hitchcock back on the wall because it was banging about a bit while I was recording. Now, it's a bit windy outside. It's a bit blowy. Everyone likes a little blowy, but it's a bit blowy outside. Oh, I've been trying to, it's still half term. So all the little bastards are out making noise. Walking past the boat going, Mammy, Mammy, oh, I want, I want. As we know, it's a famous phrase that all kids love. I want, little bastards. And because it's so blowy, the boat's banging against the side every couple of minutes. So it's really annoying. So I can't record when that's happening. Anyway, hopefully that was done. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Let me take your little hat off. There we go. Hat is off. There you go. Does that feel better? I bet it does. There we go. Oh, good. Let me, uh, should I do a tea? Let's do a tea. I've got a tea ready. Let's do a tea. Right, here we go. Uh, tea on. Looking outside. I'm just keeping an eye on there's a boat. Just a, it can, Some idiot has got a massive boat and he's only tied it in with two pins. And we've had days of rain and the ground is really soggy. And uh, me and some other guy have been going out every day repinning everyone's boats. And this guy, oh, he's just an idiot. He just doesn't give a shit. He le leaves us to sort it out. So it, it, he's just disappeared now, literally that second, which is great. He can piss off elsewhere. Oh dear. It's a nice community on the, on the waterways. Everyone helps each other out, but there's one or two people who just aren't helpful. Bits, a bit thoughtless, don't really like them. They can bugger off. He's buggering off, that's good. Right, what's going on in the world? Oh, um, so Soho Strangler's done. I hope you enjoyed that exhausting after that oh i did they, that little bit of extra time gave me time to start researching all the other cases that we're going to cover next so uh taking us all i've kind of pieced everything together all the way up till june now or july it will be so uh we're back doing one parters and two parters and uh, when we get to the middle of summer would we'll be a nice juicy three parter which has been really complicated case which has blown my head apart oh but um, because Soho Strangler was such a complicated case, which required a lot of thought and kind of dipping into all the episodes to kind of piece everything together, uh, that's why I'm doing a lot of really simple ones now. So you can all take a rest. Don't worry. There's not going to be anything too complicated now. Uh, although the three-parter is, is a... God, it's almost killed me to piece that together. That's another story never been told before. I uh, hope you enjoyed this one. That was uh, something different. Um, originally, this was going to be for Murder Ball, the book. Uh, but because Murder Ball, the book, isn't happening, uh, I decided to save it for the podcast. It kind of makes sense. You know, writing a book can take a long time. And w when I thought logically about it, I thought, realistically, how many copies am I going to sell? probably 50 maybe at a push uh and then i'll probably make what a fiver off that is it really worth really worth all that time to put all that effort in and then just make a little barely barely cover my cost i just thought bollocks to it so uh so hence this is all going into uh murder by the podcast see there you go uh what else is going on um I'm not eating treats at the moment. I'm still I'm back on diet because I walked past a mirror the other day and it was a, a long mirror and uh, it looked like Alfred Hitchcock had come back. So oh, it's not good. So I'm uh, back on a diet. Also, Eva wants me thin again. Uh, she, oh, she just makes it. It's like uh, in winter, she likes me to be really fat because uh, then she can use me like a hot water bottle. You know, when she's watching telly, she can put her feet on me as I'm resting at her feet. And because I'm fat, like a kind of her feet, her lovely, lovely, lovely feet go into my big fat flesh. And she, she's like, oh, that's nice and cozy. But as we're getting into summer, she likes me running around getting her hot, her cold drinks. And she doesn't like the uh, the ice to be too melty. So I have to be, I have to be faster. So uh, she's, she wants me to get down to kind of whip it weight so I can be super fast getting her drinks and everything she needs. Oh, oh Eva. Uh, what else is going on? Uh, Amy, Amy, uh, I killed the Christmas cactus. Yeah, sorry about that. Killed the Christmas cactus that you gave me two years ago. I put it outside for one day and uh, we had a frost and it died and I tried to I tried to save it. I did everything I could, it died. So uh, uh, I said a Riva Dutch to that. Oh, I've just bought myself a new cactus. I know. How, how useless am I at plants if I can't even keep a Christmas cactus alive? Um, 
uh, so I've bought a, ni- a nice, a really spiky kind of cactus. So that's uh, that's that's my new. Th- Let's see how long I can keep that alive for. It's currently outside, soaking up the sun. All exciting. Uh, a big thank you to new Patreon supporters. Uh, they are Michelle Davies, Laurie Chadwick Jenkins, Kylie Hollands, Ria, and Talassa or Thalassa. I'm not too sure whether it's a, a, a silent H or not. But anyway, thank you. Uh, Michelle Davies, Laurie Chadwick Jen- Jenkins, Kylie Hollands, Rhea, and uh so thank you everyone um um i hope you get all the goodies that come with it you don't, don't forget we've we've got hundreds of episodes now on on uh, uh patreon my tea's up Whoa. hang on squeeze again as you can hear the boat banging against the side there uh, tea's up. Let's let it stew for a bit. Nothing worse than a weak tea. Oh, um, so yes, Patreon. Um, um, you get lots of goodies with this. We've got low. I, th- I think I, I only started Patreon when we were up at about, I think it was like episode 50, which is, I think is the right way to do it. Too many podcasts are out there setting up podcasts, setting up Patreon accounts, having not put out episodes or haven't put out three. My rule was you've got to have a bit of a back catalogue so you can give people things or that you've got a bit of an audience as well so uh yeah i didn't start until episode 50 so we've got lots of goodies in there for you to enjoy um if you're if you're unsure about joining patreon uh, we've set up a new thing on there now which is a trial period you, so you can uh log in you can go on it for a week uh, you can have a look at it you can have a look at all the old stuff you could decide on a tier and if after that week you want to become a patron you could do it but if not that's not a problem you can just have a try it out for a week it won't cost you anything uh so it's like a try before you buy there you go how exciting is that core lummy and of course um not on the trial period but when you do sign up you get sent lots of goodies uh depending on what tier you're on so there you go and i changed i change the goodies every so often Four. right let's do the quiz questions don't forget as always i may ball some of these up because i haven't edited the episode yet uh so let's see how it goes also we're going to do the extra stuff very shortly did i say welcome to extra mile the unscripted unedited bit i don't think i did well there i've just said it so there we go uh question number one get ready everyone 10 questions let's see how good you are question number one what job did Bertold do question number two what was Bertold's full name you can hear it. You hear all the little bastards coming past the boat. Going, oh, yeah, you're the, oh, look, mum and dad, a duck. Oh, a duck. Ugh, kids. Ugh. Question number three. How long do we know that he lived in the Soho area? Question number four. On what street was his place of employment? Uh, Messrs. Farwig and Bullock. Question number five, uh, what was the market they often brought their basics at? Question number six, Hannah Hannah was from which town in Lincolnshire? Question number seven, how many children did Hannah have? Question number eight, how long was the blade of the knife? Question number nine, uh, what did Berthold treat Mrs. Hodgkins to at the tea shop? And question number 10, what was the name of the first police constable on the scene? I'm going to get my tea. That's not the answer to the question. That's just me making a statement that I'm going off to get my tea. There we go. Let's see. Let's see if this tea was all right. Looks looks okay looks okay just okay so let's pop that there a second as i return oh cripes uh so let's dive into some extra stuff there won't be a huge amount on this because this was one of those cases where there wasn't a huge amount of stuff originally there's no there's no court records about this is uh there's nothing in the old bailey uh, this is one of those things that I kind of pieced together from fragments in different places, kind of like uh, d- different records that are dotted around. So, uh, yeah, there's not a huge amount, but we'll dive into uh, what there is. So uh, the location itself, originally when I did uh, 
the uh, when this was going to be the book the book medal the book uh i'd I'd got it listed down as 15 king street which was fine and even though king street doesn't exist anymore i thought well it's a book you don't really need to go into details about this about where it was but because i'm now uh, gonna film it uh for the uh patron patron subscribers i do a nice little video that almost no one watches uh (laughs) uh so uh, to get the location exactly right i needed to find out where it is so i i've got a whole series of maps uh hidden away and i've got kind of uh 1960s maps 1940s and 30s maps 19th century maps and uh, i got some mid 18th century maps so i can do comparisons and i knew that king street before Shaftesbury avenue was created which is uh the street that basically goes from holborn and it goes all the way down to piccadilly circus uh, i knew that before that was created and before cambridge circus was created which is on the corner of um uh soho i knew that king street was roughly there uh, but i really wanted to track down exactly um exactly where 15 king street was to really pin it down so i I, it it took a a long while it didn't i didn't actually end up using this in the episode but i needed to know because i wanted to know exactly where it was so i could do the the video um so if you know soho relatively well um it's uh, not far from the uh, theater where the the harry potter is larry trotter uh it's right next to the uh the soho fire station soho fire station is where that that used to be a big theater there i think i can't remember what they used to be called it was a i think it's called the shasbury theater that used to be originally uh but next to that you have the little side street that which is now called nassau street uh, all the streets are different back then so uh wardour street was originally prince street cambridge circus didn't exist that kind of spurred off uh, Moore Street, which does exist, West Street, which still exists, Crown Street, which doesn't exist, uh, Charing Cross Road didn't exist. So this was really difficult to try and pin it down when it was. Um, most of the buildings on that street were built in the uh, 1730s. Uh, so you've got Gerard Place, which leads down to Newport Place, where uh, Red Max Cassell was murdered. Gerard Place used to be called Nassau Place which was really confusing because when i was reading this story i was like uh, the murder happened on king street and they found a policeman in nassau street and nassau street is in fitzrovia if you look at the current map today uh but when if you go back in time um nassau street uh was actually gerard place so places change all the time so it's a um this building king street is essentially just off gerard place the other side of the uh the uh where the fire station is uh, originally it was called a uh, wetton's buildings uh they were all about three stories high uh they had two lots of windows per per floor um it wasn't it was an okay area it wasn't terrible it wasn't poverty stricken it was kind of semi-comfortable working class area lots of people who had skilled trades um there were prostitutes outside you'd often find a prostitute in the doorway but it's it's soho what do you expect it's not soho it's uh it's more Haymarket, which is just over the road but but you know people call it soho it's not um today it's occupied by a building called nassau house uh, not the original building at all that was built there so when i when i did the research on uh Shasby avenue i managed to pin down which buildings were kept when they built Shasby avenue and which ones they didn't and i thought to myself oh come on there's a couple of buildings of king street that still technically exist and fortunately uh 15 was entirely demolished which was a, a real pain in the ass uh owned by a man called mr powell who was a baker uh, lots of different people who live there i i had popped in in the episode i was going to bring them up but I, I as we had a really complicated time with soho strangler I, I really decided with this one to strip everything out so not include too many other characters just really focus on on uh hannah and uh berthold uh berthold's name in there is really confusing when you go through a lot of the the details his uh uh but they've got him down as bert berthold bertolt uh, what was the other version bretolt i think they have like there's so many different versions of his name it's just really confusing and i think because it's a foreign name a lot of the times it was written down it was written down incorrectly but also like um one of the people who was there thomas i can't remember his name now 
uh, one of the guys who used to live in the same house and work with uh, Berthold as well. Uh, his name isn't even Thomas. Uh, always, I don't think I've got it written down here. Uh, a lot of people, when they came over to Britain from overseas, they would take a kind of, they would take their name and they would anglicise it. Berthold didn't seem to have done that. He probably would have changed his name to um, uh, Albert House or something like that, you know, instead of what his name was. I almost gave away a question then, uh, but not quite. I'm trying my best here. Uh, so, yeah, they lived in the attic. Uh, there were the two rooms at the top of the, the floor, which was in the attic. Uh, on the third floor, there was someone behind them, but we don't have any evidence from the person who was behind them. Um, if you want to know what the building looked like, um, it will be on the uh, video that I'll do. But if you go to number two, Gerard Place, that's one of the original buildings that's still there. It didn't quite get demolished. Um, to show how bad the area was, there's a little report there of, uh, as mentioned, of prostitutes in the doorway. And the Chancellor of the Exchequer was blackmailed on King Street just a few months before that happened, before uh, this murder happened. So you can tell that it's a little bit of a, a little bit of a dodgy street. Uh, um, diving into some other stuff. Uh, it's, it's, uh, Thomas Chater, that was it. That was the guy who uh, lived at uh, 15 King Street as well. So he was German as well, but obviously Thomas Chater wasn't his real name. Um, Thomas Chater would state that of uh, Bardolf, which is the other name they give uh, to uh, Bertolt, a lot, oh, I think it's Berdolf as well they say as well it's really hard to which is why it's hard to pin him down on the he he doesn't appear on the census or any of those kind of records until his death um so yeah it's really hard to pin down who he was um thomas chater said he was very fond of other men's wives uh, before he was married and when asked how he would like to be so served by other men he replied he would cut her throat and then commit suicide himself uh, he made a, quite a few of these references to other people but uh, i only used a few of them in there uh walter bullock his boss at farwig and bullock uh make sure i don't say that because that's a question described him as a sober man said uh near the time he would become very irritable uh he often spoke uh to the other men in the shop that's the place where he worked about being jealous of his wife he also remarked uh, uh if i should find so i.e find his wife with another man i would destroy her life and my own my own also we don't really know much about uh, Bertold's earlier life. We don't know where he comes from. We don't know whether he had mental health problems before. He doesn't seem to be a drinker. We don't know whether he was married before. We don't know really much about it. We've only got bits and pieces that we can kind of pick up from. Uh, we know that near the end of summer, it seems, that he purchased a knife, which was described... Well, people describe it as a razor, but it looks like it was some kind of... Um, not a flick knife but <coughs> kind of a folding knife uh, it was described as a sharp pointed italian spring knife so probably unlikely that it was one of those 1950s ones that you see all the hoods with and they press a button and it comes out and they go hey, i'm gonna i'm gonna fuck you up um it was more likely that it was kind of a fold-out knife but the blade was uh eight is this one of the questions i may uh Oh, I've got to be really careful. This is why I hate the quiz questions. It really throws me off sometimes. Um, so, yeah, he bought a knife. We don't know where he got it from, but he certainly had it. Whether he bought it for work, we don't know. But given the fact that he's a template worker... See, I may have given away a question. If I have given away a question, you can have it for free. Um, that's fine. There, there wouldn't really be a reason for him to buy a knife of that sort because the factory would have all the tools he needs. But maybe he bought it for himself maybe he this was something he was always planning uh but he uh, definitely said to someone uh should uh stated that if he were to find out that uh the baby was someone else is he would state uh we should both go off together in one bloody bed so he always seems to have had i i kind of held it back on this episode because I, I really wanted you to think that he was going to kill the child but the child was Oh, got hiccups. The child was entirely unharmed, but it always seemed to be something in his mind that he, whether it was whether it was shame, whether he couldn't accept the fact that um, if it if his wife had 
been sleeping with someone else that it was the shame of it he couldn't cope with that therefore he would kill her but he would also kill himself um so we don't we don't really know much about his thoughts he never wrote anything down uh the shopping trip so um hannah's mother came down to visit uh she uh, hannah had sent her mother a letter and some money to say can you come down i'm going to give birth um it looked like hannah was meant to be given birth probably christmas eve maybe christmas day but she gave birth about three days early which is why her mum wasn't there when when she gave birth so her mum wasn't, wasn't being an arsehole she was just you know and it because it was 140 miles away it would have taken a long time to get down there so uh it's not like today where you can just hop on a train it would have taken a, a, a load of time so um yeah the little shopping trip saturday night so technically christmas eve i've made reference to christmas in there but it wasn't really until kind of uh charles dickens christmas carol where people in that kind of era that's when we started entering into the christmas that we kind of have now that's what it become so in this era this is pre that um uh it's more of a religious festival I, who, who'd have thought it Who'd have thought it, eh? Christmas being about religion, I know. Whew. We've literally just passed, as of time of recording, Easter. And uh, I, I, was, I like to call it Saint Chocolate's Day. It's all about chocolate, isn't it? Does anyone need... I wonder how long it'll be before people have forgotten that... The, the, they go, what are the origins of, of Saint, Saint Chocolate's Day? <laughs> it's like, ugh um i don't care I, i'm not religious i don't care um so yeah that saturday night about just about seven o'clock it was snowing it was cold um Berthold had been really nice to uh hannah um, I, I i held this out of the story but uh hannah his wife her mother is called hannah so i deliberately kind of just called her mother-in-law or mrs hodgkins just so we don't go hang on because there's only two characters in the story and two of them called hannah which is really annoying um back in the era where people had no <laughs> they they'd, they'd have a child and they think what should we call the child i know i can't be bothered to think of anything i'll just call it after myself <laughs> oh dear um that's fine if people want to do that that's fine <laughs> um so they went shopping he decided instead of taking her to Berwick street market that may have been a question as well fine you get that as a freebie uh i can't remember the questions I, i've got them written at the top of the page and i'm not going to check them so he took her to kind of mayfair kind of nice area burlington arcade had been opened about 40 years prior to this quite a well-to-do area not all of mayfair was always nice and uh um posh it's it, same as everywhere else in kind of london there was pockets there was bits where it's really nice and then bits where it's really grotty and poor uh same as soho there's bits where it was always lovely and then bits where you just go oh wow that's horrible uh anyway he decided to take her all the way there it looks like this was almost certainly a kind of ruse because uh, if he would have taken her to Berwick street market that is two minute walk from the house if that and all you've pretty much got to do is go go south and then left a bit um wouldn't be difficult to find whereas if you were to take take her to uh the market over in mayfair that's a 15 to 20 minute walk don't forget it's in the snow she doesn't know the area it's uh, it, it was a good ploy because he was able to go we're going to buy some nice stuff for the kind of the baby and the infant and all that but really he was just trying to distract her he would dump her in a coffee shop uh, and then he could go off and do what he needed to do um we know that they left about 7 p.m we know that he um he uh we know that the murder happened just before nine um we know that hannah's mother sat in the coffee shop for about two hours because she was waiting for him to come back she'd she'd kind of sitting there waiting thinking oh well he'll definitely be back soon and then coffee shop shut and she was like oh shit where do i go we we don't know how long it took her to get back uh but that was clearly a ruse to kind of distract her so he could go back and, and stab his wife to death what a lovely man um what else we got yeah i mean uh according to her he said uh i'm just gonna go off and get some uh essentials i think he said what, what was the word he said uh to purchase some necessities for the infant um 
He said, I'll be back in a minute. She replied, mind you do, or I shall never find my way back, which is pretty much the whole point of being there. Um, the timing seemed to be out on this. In one account, it says she waited till nine. In another account, it says she waited until quarter past 11, which is a big difference. Uh, but either way, she didn't make it, make it out in time. Um, uh, uh, her mother never really recovered from this some people said that afterwards uh I've got a quote here it said it it nearly sent her out of her mind as you can kind of understand her, her daughter's been brutally murdered to death by a man who she probably approved of to marry him uh, and uh she was one of the few people who could have stopped the murder from happening but do you know would anything really have stopped Bertolt? we don't we don't know whose baby the child was we don't know what he saw we don't know whether he looked at the baby and thought oh that that definitely doesn't look like me so um i think i think he's just a man who was in, entirely fixated with the idea a jealous man entirely fixated on the idea that she was cheating on him even though he was by all accounts seemed to be a bit of a shit bag anyway um so yeah it's i i think he, i think either way even if the baby looked identical to him, he would still find something in his in his mind to say, "Oh, it's definitely not my child." Oh, maybe it's my brother's or something like that. You know, he's that kind of shitbag. Um, what else we got? Uh, I think that might be it. I'm not going to dive in too much on here. Uh, murder happened roughly uh, three what well, he entered the house about three minutes to nine and it probably happened around nine o'clock um, Francis Lloyd who was the the lovely sound of children oh ugh um I wonder, can someone create a mute button for children? Do you see, do you see, you could just pull out a remote and just go blip and they're, they're just silent. Silent and still. That would be really lovely. Um, so, yeah, he arrived back about three minutes to nine, so the murder probably happened around nine o'clock. Um, uh, Francis Lloyd said he heard a cry of murder. He rushed up to the second floor landing where. <laughs> Mrs. Heiss, Hannah, uh, was in a bloodied nightdress. She said, I am a murdered. I still don't know whether people actually said that in that era. You see it everywhere where people shout the word murder. But in modern times, where do you ever hear anyone shouting murder? Murder or I am murdered. It's like, it, it, I think it's just one of those things that when people are writing stuff down, they, they just go, oh, what did you say? And they go, oh, do you know, it just seems of that era that's something that everyone would say he said the landing was dark he couldn't see much he got a candle with him he said come my good woman come with me thank god we don't talk like that anymore uh and he helped her down to his room uh, by candlelight he saw that she was covered in blood uh he grabbed her by the arm and led her down and uh she uh, sat on her sofa on his sofa um and uh he said at that point her strength failed her which means she passed out uh i think that's it i think that's it oh yeah let's just let's just read what the uh the doctor said so um uh so it was dr edward martin of 44 fifth street which is just over the road he said the wounds were self-inflicted uh there was a cut from ear to ear all blood vessels nerves arteries were cut it was only the cervical vertebrae which prevented his head from falling off what a lovely lovely sentence that is um apparently he cut his own throat while sitting upright he then thrown himself backwards onto the bed the knife and a razor this is slightly confusing on there because they, they they make reference to the knife or razor but in some places they make reference to knife and razor could have been both uh so both cartoid arteries were cut the jugular vein on the left hand side uh was cut as well having swept directly across the larynx uh the man himself was quite dead when the medical gentleman arrived uh, upon entering the room he said there was a frightful scene presented before him the floor was a pool of blood and heist lay partially upon the bed his throat cut from ear to ear his uh, he had literally severed his head from the body with the exception of the vertebrae's um windpipe was cut as well and the soft parts had been cut right through um 
Heiss lay on the uh, bed. Uh, the floor was pulled with blood. What else have we got here? Uh, he said it was steaming, which was a lovely image. So I used that in the episode as well. Uh, and Mr. Clark remarked that he had never seen such an extensive self-inflicted wound. Uh, and a, a, a quote that I didn't, I don't think he used in the episode. Uh, it was needless to say he was quite dead. No shit. No shit. So let's let's go dive into the questions. Let's see how many have balls up. If I have balls down up, that's fine. You get that for free. Way. Question number one. What job did Berthold do? He was a tin plate worker, which I know I ballsed up. So uh, you get that one for free. But uh, if you didn't already know that one, then you don't get it for free. How could you not get that? I gave it away. Uh, question number two. What was Berthold's full name? It was Berthold Theodore Heiss. 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 Sounds like what what Prince Philip or King uh, Prince Philip would say uh, where he lives. I live in Heiss. Uh, question number three. How long do we know that he lived in and around the Soho area? He was definitely there for about four years. Question number four. On what street was his place of employment? Messrs. Farwig and Bullock. That was on Rupert Street. So Rupert Street uh, is a road that goes goes from Soho into Haymarket. It goes from uh, not Berwick Street, uh, Brewer Street. It goes from Brewer Street right down across Shaftesbury Avenue. And then it takes you down to Coventry Street, which is the road leading into uh, Leicester Square. Core, dear. I'm like GPS. Question number six. Uh, oh no, question number five. What was the market uh, they often brought their basics? That was the Berwick Street Market. Uh, question number six. Hannah was from which town in Lincolnshire? Spalding. That's what. That's how Eva describes me. She just points at me and goes, Spalding. As in, that's balding. I'm not balding, I'm bald. Uh, question number seven. How many children did Hannah have? It was a trick question. Uh, she had two before she met Berthold, but one had died before she met him. Uh, and when she was with Berthold, she had another one. So it's uh, technically three. Uh, question number eight. How long was the blade of the knife? I gave this one away almost. So uh, it was eight inches long. Ooh, uh... Question number nine. What did Berthold treat Mrs. Hodgkins to at the tea shop? I mean, you should have got half of this because the answer was in the question. It was tea and buns. And question number ten. Who was the first PC on the scene? His name was Police Constable James Venner of the Metropolitan Blood. So there we go. There we go, folks. That's that done. Oh, Oh, lummy. So that's me done. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Uh, next week, I th it's a two-parter, but it's not really a, a, a brain effer. It's it, it's just a, one that one that has a lot of fun with it. So uh, I say fun. Someone gets murdered in a horrible way. Um, so we'll do that next week. Uh, again, another case you you uh, won't hear anywhere else. Thank God for that. Uh, children. Oh, this is what makes recording difficult shouting children have yourself a good week folks stay safe and be good lots of love <laughs>